Welcome everyone to this episode of the DIY Maker, where I'm going to take a look at what it takes to transform a massive Madrone log into a really effective and to me the perfect axe carving solution for me. Is it perfect for everybody? No. It's not exactly portable, but man, it is solid and a joy to work on. So join me as we jump into this adventure of making an incredible tool for my outdoor studio and at the end meet the guy that actually made this possible. This episode on the DIY Maker is dedicated to creating a really, really useful carving workstation for the outdoor studio. And uh, I've got to say, I've got the ultimate candidate here. This is an enormous 17-inch uh, diameter Madrone log. For those that don't know, Madrone is uh, predominantly a West Coast wood, I believe. It's, it's for burning, it's considered the ultimate in BTU value. It even beats out oak out here. Um, but this is a really, really solid stump that a friend of mine dug out of the woods for me. Uh, I went and grabbed it in my trusty Toyota truck. And now we're going to uh, square up this bottom. Um, we've got a, this old carpenter square was actually my father's. And uh, we're going to true up this base. And uh, there's almost no taper to this log at all. It's almost a perfect column, uh, which is surprising how close this was to the root ball. But anyway, we're going to uh, gonna get this squared up and then trim the length. And then we're going to put some really cool profiles in it to make it what I think is the ultimate carving tool for using axes and things like that for uh, doing some out outdoor spoon carving, bushcraft kind of stuff, things of that nature. So here we go. In this segment, I'm just gonna focus on getting the bottom of this log perpendicular to the column so that it sits perfectly vertical on the ground and gives me a really stable, planted work surface to do some ax carving on. I think we're going to call that close enough. Now I've got to turn this monster around and work on the other end. In this next cut that I'm going to make, I'm actually cutting the highest feature on this carving platform, which will be the top of the rectangular block that acts like a stop for keeping the work from sliding away from me as it's being chopped at with the axe. Um, this is tuned to my height, which is if you're standing straight up and down and a closed fist, the distance from the flat of your knuckles down to the ground is close to the ideal height. Some guys like it a little higher or a little lower, depending on their own unique personal geometry. I tend to like it a little taller. It helps with both my vision and my back and my arm length. It, it works really well for me. Here I'm just truing up the surface a little bit uh, before I make the trace for the rectangle protrusion. No real magic here, I'm just using a sharpie and my square to lay out a rectangular area where I'm going to trim around with the chainsaw so that that part remains. Now I'm going to take my miniature skill saw and just cut along those black lines to isolate the rectangular block. I've already taken a few parallel cuts to start isolating that block. And here is me repositioning the log to get the final cut to isolate the block completely 
from the rest of the log. This depth that I used on the little skill saw was inch and a half, so that block sticks up an inch and a half off the surface. And I gotta say that height has worked out really well in actually using this. All right, I think that's it for the uh, whittling on this log. We're going to uh, get things cleaned up here, spin this around and drop it down on the ground where hopefully I never have to move this again. This is the downside of going with a full log for a carving block is it's not exactly what you'd call portable, but uh, I'm hopeful that it's gonna become a great tool for, uh, for exploring some ax carving. Now hopefully I can drop this, guide it down so that it stays vertical. Otherwise, I'm just gonna get out of the way. And there we have it. We'll see how this height works for us. I am gonna do uh, a little notch cut right here. We'll do that now. I think I want a V-notch too. Here I'm just taking some planishing and truing cuts on the top surface with a nice newly sharpened blade. Uh, just trying to true up the work surface, make it, uh, make it look nice and neat and clean. Next up we're going to reposition this monster in the place where I hope it stays for a very very long time. Now we need a quick project to test out our, our axe carving block. And I did a spoon. Now I don't consider myself a spoon carver. I am not worthy to rub compound on their straps. I am just a guy who carved a spoon. And uh, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Hey everybody, I've been talking about this amazing carving station that I made in this video. And I want to give credit to the guy that drag this monstrous freaking log out of the woods and give him a chance to share who he is. Um, and this is my friend Kento, and I want to introduce you to him and let him tell you his amazing life story because I think it's, it's pretty effing cool. Thanks, Bill. You're too <laughs> kind. That's a nice introduction. Uh, I wanted you to know it's my pleasure to have been able to help you out finding this nice log. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you are in need because uh, it's a beautiful piece of Madrone. Oh, I, and, uh, I gotta say, I, uh, I, I thought Madrone would have been a great choice. And when you had mentioned to me that you identified one on the side of your mountain that you thought would be the ideal candidate for this project, I was like, I was gonna go get another piece of the, uh, of the black cottonwood that I used for that set. And uh, Ken said, no, let me, let me get you a piece of the Madrone. And, and you did. So you dragged this off the side of a mountain and it was an even bigger log than what's here in front of you. I actually cut this down a little bit uh, to carve the profiles out and to make the height correct for me. But you, you manhandled this log by yourself quite a distance to get it out of the, off the mountain. 
And then you and I work together to get it the rest of the way. Yeah, and thank you for that. Uh, because I, I think when I called you, I'd reached the point where I couldn't physically get it any further. You look pretty you tired. Know. Yeah, yeah, but it was worth it. Like I said, uh, thrilled to be able to help you out with your channel and your projects. It's a brilliant idea. I'm going to do the same for me. And you'd asked about you know my background yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. thing. Um, my whole professional background is uh, as an animal handler. Um, uh, for 26 years, I uh, worked at the Birds of Prey show uh, at the San Diego Wild Animal Park, mm -hmm. which is operated by the Zoological Society of San Diego. It's the San Diego Zoo folks, basically. And uh, started there when I was 18, just doing a, a live show with birds and birds of prey. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of the 26 years, I was really lucky enough uh, to have a chance to work with, I mean, all kinds of birds, condors, owls, vultures, falcons, hawks, eagles. Um, I've handled all manner of birds and helped out rehab centers with uh, coping beaks and helping, you know, trim talons and this, mm -hmm. this and the opportunity to make some television appearances and got to, uh, uh, one of the, I think it was the last year that Johnny Carson was the host of the Tonight Show. I got to accompany my supervisor at the time when she was the guest. But uh, later on, I think I made two, two for sure. I think three appearances with Jay Leno, um, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, her first season. Uh, so I, you were the <laughs> animal handler of the stars. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's. Uh, there's, there's, you know, a number of people that are really well known for it now, Jack Hanna and that sort of thing. Um, at the time, I was excited because I got to be on television. To me, that was a big deal. I managed to do these talk show appearances and also uh, some movie and television uh, commercial work with the animals, birds specifically, and uh, none of it ever went south. And I was really most proud of that because a lot of it's high risk, you know, free flight birds, in a new situation with a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stimulus. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and literally in the, you know, we, uh, when we were doing Stephen King's The Stand, we were shooting out in the middle of the Nevada desert. And, and it was windy. Um, the bird could have been spooked or blown off course or attacked. You know, there's always the risk of wild raptors coming around. Um, but <laughs> one of the really cool things when you have a really good rapport with an animal, They'll trust you enough that even though you have them in a situation that seems a little bit dodgy and they're not in, they're in their comfort zone necessarily, their, their trust in you sort of helps make them, uh, uh, you know, make, makes the whole thing more palatable for them. And it strengthens, strengthens your bond. And, uh, you know, what's more exciting than a road trip with a, an animal? You know, what uh, better definition of a true friend than somebody who will follow you into some seriously sketchy stuff and stay with you? Yeah. I mean, that's how you know you have actually have a relationship with that creature. Yep, yep. Here's this, uh, you know, this Hollywood legend, you know, in his golden years. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to, like, sort of have him as a mentor and hear some of the old stories and learn some of the old tricks, um, which that's something else is kind of fun is... You know, there's there's ways to accomplish things without stressing your animal out. Uh, if you're clever, you can figure out a way to, to get something done for them to get the shot and, and have everybody be happy and have it be transparent. Um, 